Well, good afternoon. This is the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at Harvard. We welcome you this afternoon to talk about the death of Osama bin Laden and uh, what this may mean. Uh, let me uh, start by reminding people this is a good time to turn off your cell phones or anything else that make noise, uh, since we'd like to have a chance to uh, hear from our panelists today. Uh, the topic is uh, one about which the news loves chattering, chattering, chattering. So we're going to, at least for the first half of this event, try to talk uh, not about the chatter, but about the significance. Uh, in the, then we're going to turn to the audience for Q&As. Again, brief questions will be in order. If at that point you want to tell how you feel about the subject or what this brought to mind or other such topics, I won't rule that out as long as it has a question mark at the end. But uh, what's happened is a pretty remarkable uh, rush. Uh, all of us are filled with lots of ideas and lots of emotions. Uh, but trying to figure out sort of what may this mean at this stage is a little premature, but nonetheless, uh, in the real world, uh, that's what's required. And we've got a great panel today to contribute to this conversation. So let me start from uh, Rolf uh, Moet Larson on this far end. Rolf is a uh, senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He was a legendary uh, American intelligence officer over a career of uh, three decades. Uh, after 9-11, uh, he was uh, scheduled to go off to Beijing to be the station chief, but uh, uh, President Bush and George Tennant, who was director of CIA, had a different idea. Uh, they hijacked him and said, uh, your job now is the intersection between Osama bin Laden and weapons of mass destruction. So... Uh, he knows a lot about Osama bin Laden. He knows a lot about tracking Osama bin Laden. He knows a lot about Osama bin Laden's would-be encounters with weapons of mass destruction. Indeed, maybe at some stage we get you to tell the story about visiting Mr. Musharraf after 9-11, or President Musharraf, to explain to him how it could be a lot worse than 9-11. Uh, Bob Kinder is in the middle. Bob is a student here at the school, which is a good reminder to us of what a remarkable group of students uh, the school has a benefit to have. Bob is an outstanding special forces officer. So as an army ranger, he was in the same business as the Navy SEALs who conducted this operation. And then for the last five years before he came here, he was a special advisor to General McChrystal uh, and General Petraeus, first in Iraq and then in Afghanistan and particularly with respect to the topic of uh, uh, special forces and their operations. And then finally, you can, my uh, colleague here to the left is a Shornstein fellow here at the center this year, a Pakistani, Wajad Khan, who's a distinguished journalist from Pakistan. He's an anchor, uh, has been an anchor for the television, uh, major television networks in Afghanistan. He's a print journalist. Fox. Uh, Fox now. Pakistan. Not oh, Afghanistan. Pakistan. I'm excuse me. Pakistan. Pakistan. I excuse wish me. I was in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, uh, in Pakistan. Let me apologize. Uh, uh, and uh, was embedded with the Pakistani military forces in Pakistan uh, and then ultimately divorced from those uh, forces so that he's both seen the inside and uh, now is regarded, I think, by most upstanding Pakistani military officers as an outsider uh, and sometimes critic. Uh, that's fair? Uh, fair enough. Okay. So uh, the conversation today, as I say, will go as follows. I'm the, quote, interrogator or the uh, instigator or the trouble causer. I'll try to do quick questions and quick answers from our panel to start with, particularly where members disagree with each other. Don't, don't be shy. So if we were to say on the elevator, and when the elevator gets to the top, we have to stop, what are the two or three takeaways from what we know so far about the significance of uh, the demise of uh, Osama bin Laden? Well, why don't we start? I would offer three quick, quick ones. First is uh, the, there's likely to be a, a threat, actually, uh, spike in the next weeks and months because al-Qaeda will be trying to avenge the leader's death as well as prove that they're still a viable organization. 
uh, and the U.S. Uh, military and intelligence will be trying just as hard to deliver some sort of knockout blow uh, to prevent that from happening and take out this group to the extent they can. The second point would, I would say is that uh, we, we have to watch what happens within al-Qaeda from a leadership level. Certainly, Ayman Zawahiri right now is probably running for the hills. They're trying to figure out how much damage was caused by this raid. And so we, we need to watch the space very carefully of how, what happens to the leadership of what we call al-Qaeda core, whether it's going to continue along the lines of this decentralized model that they've been pursuing since 9-11. And the final point is uh, what, what really, uh, how do we repair the damage between U.S.-Pakistani relationships, both on a political level as well as an intelligence level as a result of what's happened? That's a good elevator speech. Rob, what do you got? I, I concur with Rolf. The only thing I would add is... Uh, regarding future terrorist attacks, one of the things uh, that, that we've learned over the last 10 years is on a, on a target is to quickly exploit any actual intelligence that you can gather. And the first course of action is to look uh, to prevent imminent attacks against the United States or her interest or, or our allies' interests around the world. And secondly, is to target uh, those deputies, to gather information to target those deputies, and Zawahiri is now our number one target. And I would back up a little and uh, look at the big picture. I would uh, go as far back as the 80s and not repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, keep in mind, all of this started when the, this country's uh, disengagement in that part of the world started. Uh, once again, there was a tangible goal at that point. The tangible goal was the Soviet withdrawal. It seems like another tangible goal has been achieved. Let's not disengage. Let's not get ahead of ourselves because uh, this has happened in the past before. There has been a massive victory recorded, and uh, even more massive mistakes have been recorded after that. And I would back away a little even more and look at al-Qaeda and bifurcate it with the, and rather combine it with the, with the larger endgame in Afghanistan. How is that going to play out? So AQ is done for. Okay, great. So Zwahiri... Uh, is probably on the run. Those five computers, et cetera, they found will, might indicate something about where he is. That's, it's only logical to assume that Zwahiri is next. But uh, what about the back channel negotiations with the Taliban? What's going on there? So there's a larger picture here, and I'd be a little pessimistic about the follow-ups. Okay. So I think a good reminder, and actually, let's drill down on a couple of these items. Let me start there and then come back here. So, Wolf and Bob, to just take us operationally behind the veil here for a second. So there's an operation like Osama bin Laden. Lots of information is captured at the site. What's the next one, two, three, four things that happen well, in Bob, general Bob and that are likely happening I'll let today. Bob uh, take, take you through some of that, but just to offer an opening. Uh, as he said, this information is perishable. They'll probably make a very, we call in the intelligence world, a damage assessment of what's been lost and what's, what, what's at risk. And they're going to be frantically trying to uh, there's a race against time here on both sides. On the U.S. side, there's going to be a race to try to exploit any actionable information that was found. On the al-Qaeda side, there's going to be a, a race to try to move away from whatever's there that's actionable to get them out of harm's way. By the way, this is very similar to what happened uh, actually after the 9-11 attack, and we're going to be repeating a little bit of history here. But with that, maybe I'll give it to you to elaborate. That's really your, your expertise. No, you're, you're right on, but uh, al-Qaeda has morphed and adapted in the last 10 years as we, as we have targeted their leadership and high-value targets. Uh, it's a very diffuse organization. Uh, it's more franchised, if you will, nowadays, diffuse around the world, uh, and they have essentially a, an intent of, uh, from Osama bin Laden. That, that intent remains. It will not change with Zawahiri uh, taking the reins or as there's a vacuum in the leadership. And uh, they're going to, we can expect spikes, I believe, in the next week or two as we're trying to run down those leads that we gathered there on target. Uh, we can anticipate spikes around the world. And frankly, uh, bin Laden, I believe, has been surpassed in the last couple of years with uh, the al Qaeda on the Arab Peninsula, uh, al Waqi, uh, predominantly. They're, they're a very, very dangerous threat to the United States. Okay. Let, let me go back uh, uh, just a second, Wahad, to the point that you made uh, to drill down on that one for a second. So most people here are too young to probably remember that the Soviet Union went into Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, supported an effort of the Mujahideen, one of whom 
turned out to be a guy named Osama bin Laden to get the Soviets out. Uh, I was uh, actually somewhat involved in this in one of my earlier incarnations. There was uh, significant support for that from Pakistan, because that was the main logistical route, but also the Pakistanis were some of the main fighters. The funding came often from Saudi. That's a little bit of how Osama bin Laden uh, got there. Uh, once the Soviet Union was defeated, uh, that job was done, mission accomplished, and we went home okay? uh, and let Afghanistan become Afghanistan again and let Pakistan be whatever it wanted to be. But in any case, of somewhat of a, of a back to the back burner. And from the point of view of Afghans, the reason why they think Americans love them and leave them is because that's what they've experienced. And from the point of view of Pakistanis, if I understand it, they think that's the American pattern. So that must be what folks are anticipating today if we're true to, to the course. Is that right? Well, um, Graham, first of all, I'm going to I mean, open up with the following that uh, I, I received a text this morning from a colleague here who's also a Pakistani. And uh, all he said when he heard that I was going to be speaking here tonight, he said, I hope you do not defend the indefensible. And firstly, that's my, that's my setup. Um, um, national biases aside, we all have uh, particular interests. And uh, all of that fun stuff aside, um, leaving uh, Pakistan in charge of Afghanistan in the 80s, to wrap up your point, is, uh, the, is analogous to leaving a heroin addict in charge of the drug dealer. Uh, that's what happened in the 1980s. Pakistan is a state addicted to grand strategies. It's, a, it's, it's run by a military establishment, which is essentially paranoid, uh, for the right reasons, mind you, because that military has taken some sound beatings since the last 60 years. It's been uh, left high and dry by its friends, like this country, other friends in the region as well. It's been ripped apart by a war by its next-door neighbor. So paranoia about India uh, is not unfounded. Thus, in the 80s and what happened before and after, uh, everything which is the whole, the whole shebang about the Pakistani military being myopic and uh, et cetera, et cetera, about the region, I don't think that paranoia is unfounded at all considering the, the country was essentially ripped apart by war with India. Secondly, um, after the heroin addict was left in charge of the drug dealer, a lot of things have happened since then. But another constant variable is this country's back and forths, uh, doing business with the wrong people. Uh, since 9-11, this country has absolutely the big debate right now. Uh, Matt, Rachel Maddow, for example, is going crazy about this on TV right now, saying Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan. It was always Pakistan. It will always be Pakistan. So why are we giving money to Pakistan? It's not just Maddow. Everybody's saying it as well. Well, just a reminder, uh, absolutely, a lot of money has gone into Pakistan. And still, this is what we get out of Pakistan. But just keep in mind that the money which you people, this country's taxpayers, have been giving to Pakistan in one way or the other for the last decade has essentially gone to the wrong people. Most of it has gone to the military. And just so you know, all sorts of toys have been granted that military. For example, they've been given harpoon missiles, which for anybody who's a weapons buff here knows that they're meant for subs, for killing submarines. I don't think uh, the Taliban or hopefully Osama don't have access to submarines. If they do, we're a mess. We're, we're in a mess right now. But anyways, um, uh, maybe Zwahiri's in one of them somewhere in the I.O. Could be. <laughs> right? But um, the bottom line is, Graham, that... Um, I am going to be a little pessimistic uh, about, uh, about you know, opening up the gambit on Pakistan in this one. I think three things could have happened. A, they didn't know, which uh, I am not ready to believe, but keep in mind that this military intelligence setup has failed its country several times, and it continues to fail its country today. Uh, today, the Pakistani people have no electricity, no jobs, no gas. 20 hours a day of what we call load shedding. Now, if we had a good IC, if we had a good, force, insightful intelligence community, we'd at least have some electricity. Forget harboring terrorists. We don't even have that. So they've done a pretty good job failing us. Forget failing the Pentagon or failing America or failing the White House. Secondly, very importantly, if they did know, then this is the old Pakistan adage that this was Osama was their big trump card, that he would be presented 
in good time to influence the end game in AFPAC as it is developing. And if you think about it, there is some sense to that as well. That, yes, right now Pakistan's negotiated itself into a pretty good position to figure out what's going on with the Taliban, but not so good when it comes to direct dealings with the, with the states. But lastly, which is the most important point, is that, and I'm sure Rolf, being the, the CIA guy here, I never thought I'd sit next to a ranger and a CIA guy and a Harvard professor, by the way. This is, if we'd put you, this between, is, if this we'd is, put this, you between the two, you might not have survived. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you don't need SEAL Team 6 for that. But <laughs> anyways, um, the big thing is plausible deniability. Um, I have a feeling that uh, there's so much distrust in the two militaries, in the Pakistani and the U.S. military, that the deal was sort of announced a while ago that, listen, you're not, we know you're not going to tell us, we're not going to tell you when we know where he is. When we're going to hit him, how do you want to play it out? And the Pakistanis are doing exactly what was probably decided years ago. We're going to back away from the crime scene. And that's exactly what seems to have happened. They have been caught, quote-unquote, the leading newspaper of that country with their pants down. Right? So, and they haven't come out with any, any possible... Well, let's stay with the pack, pack piece just for a little bit, and let me both uh, push you both of uh, our other colleagues. So, um, Panetta, uh, the director of CIA, now nominated to become the new Secretary of Defense, said, to him, it's inconceivable that some part of the Pakistani government uh, in the establishment was unaware of a guy who's, uh, whatever, 35 miles away from Islamabad, which is the main military city. In, in, uh, and, uh, and how many, you know, a, a stone's throw away from a military base? Okay. There are actually Either, three, three regiments uh, within a stone's throw and also their military academy. We've got quite a few West Point graduates here, so it would be uh, similar to bin Laden setting up uh, a mansion next to West Point or the Naval Academy. Okay. Well, so would, yeah. so if, it, if it's inconceivable, so then in the course of this treasure trove that's been c- captured, I'm now just trying to say what's going to happen. So I'm going to look and I'm going to find phone numbers of some Pakistani military people, I suspect, or some traces or something. So now it's a week from now... And we're pretty clear that there's a, a degree of knowledge of Pakistan, uh, Pakistani's establishment, either military or intelligence or both, in the fact that Osama bin Laden has been harbored there. So keep going. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think to just let us sit back for a second and imagine, uh, based again on press reporting, I, I don't personally have any inside knowledge specifically this, and I think that's a good thing, because one of the things this proved is that we could keep secrets. Uh, but based, again, on, on how, how, how things work, of course, if it was months, that we were, or even years, that we, the U.S. was monitoring this facility, uh, in addition to determining whether bin Laden was actually in there, another key consideration would be who goes in there, who else is in there, uh, and aside from the military questions that would relate to how to conduct the operation, there would be a question of uh, who's behind the facility? Now, if you've got something you could watch 24-7 with various ways. So I hope there are a lot of answers already. Uh, I think the real problem here is that you could really only left with one of two conclusions. Either there was complicity or a stunning degree of incompetence on, on behalf of... And, and either, either conclusion is, is problematic. I would say, having just said that, that I think we're going to have to sort through this um, it, as outrageous as it, whatever it might turn out to be, to the extent that uh, we uh, need, we have, we need to remember, we have in fact captured together, worked together to capture people like uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin Al Shib, and a number Abu Faraj Al Libya, and a number of other key seniors in Pakistan working together. So let's not throw all that away. Uh, at, the, at the same time, I'll say as an old intelligence, which I'm not anymore. I'm a Harvard senior fellow. Uh, a former intelligence, a former officer. intelligence person, uh, and a, that, and I work with virtually every intelligence organization in the world in some capacity, including some very unsavory ones. Uh, and and, and in, the, in that process, it was never because you loved each other uh, or were great buddies. Although relationships are important, it's because you had self-interest. So 
what, what there's going to be here, I think, in the coming weeks is, is, is a very deep introspection and, and, and uh, review of self-interest in a new light. Uh, but, but, Ralph, let me just uh, disagree slightly, I would say, absolutely. Uh, so, on the one hand, I agree. And the intelligence community, if this was simply an intelligence community issue, would get over it. Intelligence communities know that each other lies, steal, and cheat with each other, even with their guys that they're working with. That's part of the business. So I would say that's called adult life. It's un- unpleasant, uncomfortable, what did you say, unsavory, but life. So I'm okay with that. What the politics of this, though, I think is not, that's another subject. So now if I say, uh, can I admit, if it becomes to be a well-known fact, which I think if it's a fact, it'll become a well-known fact or well-reported fact, that there was a high degree of complicity in this. Uh, how d- difficult is to predict the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. is going to change fundamentally? Well, fundamentally. I, I grab, okay, and then to, how yeah, is that going to go? Yeah. To, to that specific point, is, is, uh, I didn't want to prejudge whether the degree of here. complicity, yeah. if the degree of complicity is, say, all the way to the top, and ISI were protecting bin Laden, I think that might be a fatal, fatal to the relationship. But then uh, if, if we if try to fact, think, what does that mean? Well, okay. if, it's, if it's something short of that, which I can well imagine, okay. or more ambigu- ambiguous, that's the situation I think I was trying to describe. Right. But I think to the degree there's clarity, uh, that's going to present some real quantity. I don't know my colleagues here, what they think I of think, that. I think that's I a think real even, problem. I think even if it's fuzzy, I mean, if, again, if you were doing this operation, you would have it with plausible deniability so that you would keep it ambiguous. If I were running this for the Pakistani intelligence and I were doing it, I shouldn't have been doing it, but if I were doing it, I would still have it such a way that it could keep it as ambiguous as possible. A little bit like uh, why was the U.S. trying to assassinate or who was involved in trying to assassinate Castro. There's still a debate about whether Kennedy, quote, knew about it. That seems to be a very implausible debate, but it's still a debate that's had because of the, of the system. But if it becomes in the terms of the politics, I don't think the likelihood of Congress voting money for Pakistan, I think it just is going to be over. Okay, mm-hmm. and then you sort of say, well, then how's this relationship going to change? So I, th- I just think the dynamics there are one to watch. Bob, you I were think there's going to be three organizations heavily involved in trying to get to the bottom of this, and it's State Department uh, through the Secretary of State and her deputies, Department of Defense, uh, and likely through ISAF and General Petraeus's. Uh, successor that's going in. I know they have worked. General McChrystal, General Petraeus, General Rodriguez, General Mayville worked very, very hard with General Kiani to build that bridge because we absolutely need uh, the support of Pakistan there in western Pakistan, the Fatah, uh, the Fada rather, to, uh, to help us with the Afghanistan problem. It, it is not separate issue as, as everyone in here knows. And then uh, finally, the intelligence community is going to have to be involved, the, the three what? of them. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to quote uh, this country's military chief, one admiral, Mike Mullen, a couple of years ago. I think it was in Time magazine when he uh, made a reference to that awful book uh, and said that I think I'm on my second cup of tea with General Kiani. And uh, I, uh, firstly, the book's been disclaimed. Uh, secondly, uh, I hope they were, I wish they were, they were taking espresso shots uh, instead of sipping tea because uh, they obviously didn't wake up to some stark facts. I'm not going to name who because it was an off-the-record discussion, but there was a very high-ranking military official in this school not so long ago, um, and um, he essentially said that we like Kiani, uh, but it took us a while to finally figure out that uh, he uh, will do what is good for Pakistan. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is news, and it should be treated as, as news, that it's taken the military establishment of this country uh, to, for, for it to kick into gear that, oh, the Pakistani military is not like, it's not an outsourced military. It's not, it's not like, oh, the Army, U.S., Marine Corps, Air Force, and the Pak Army. No, it doesn't work like that. They're, they're a separate entity, so I think they need to be treated like one as well. Uh, in defense and in offense of that military setup uh, and in response to especially what Ralph was saying. Um, I don't think it needs, to be, it needs to be noted and not just brushed aside that that military has taken some really hard hits. It's been hammered 
in Fata, its installations across the country have been attacked. It's lost more men, uh, and even women, by the way, because there are women in that military. It's lost more men and women than this country's military, for that matter, for all uh, military casualties uh, NATO wise have included in Afghanistan. Uh, does that mean they are committed uh, fully? No, it doesn't mean they're committed fully. Does that mean they're fighting hard? Maybe. But does that mean uh, they are fully on board? No, no. And they're not going to be. And keep in mind uh, that at the end of the day, this is a very nuanced war. The Pakistanis have a once bitten, twice shy uh, approach about this. The Pakistanis didn't get in line and offer their country as a base. Uh, there was a threat, according to President Musharraf. The threat was made by the U.S. Uh, was it the Under Secretary? The of Deputy State? Secretary of State by Richard Armitage said you had himself. Two good choices. Uh, one, uh, do it, um, get in line, and help us attack the Taliban, and thus conduct this famous U-turn brackets, which is going to blow your country up. Black brackets closed. Um, or second, get bombed back into the Stone Age. And this is uh, when America says get bombed back into the Stone Age, we're not talking about the Pakistani military thinking it's going to be like the Flintstones. I think they have a pretty good idea about what that means. And uh, at the end of the day, this is a weak military. It's a failing economy. Um, uh, If there was an intelligence failure, and I think the biggest elephant in the room right now, and perhaps Rolf, who's worked with these guys much more than the rest of us, I think the ISI has done a fantastic job of brand building globally. I think uh, they are very, they have the marketing team just, just kicks butt worldwide, right? I think they have scared the rest of us into thinking they're all knowing, all pervasive. But guess what? If the ISI was really all knowing, then it wouldn't have. The ISI has been around, by the way, for almost 60 years now. The, it, was, it was massive intelligence failures which led to massive defeats in both the 65 and the 71 war by the ISI with India. Pakistan has lost its wars with India. Pakistan, for some reason, if there was, for example, in the AQ Khan scandal, they blew that up as well, if they were involved as well. They have run intelligence failure after intelligence failure, and they have failed that country one time after the other. I am not shocked to hear if, if I know it's implausible because they were in the military town, West Point, da-da-da, but maybe they just didn't know, Graham. Okay. Maybe they just didn't know, because they, are, they can be that incompetent. We'll, we'll see. Golf, t- t- tell us uh, about your visit to uh, Mr. Musharraf and your interactions with the ISI on that occasion, and your, in re- relative to this, your general assessment of whether they're one of the worst or one of the better intelligence agencies you dealt with. Well, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. reluctant to judge in, in terms of whether they're good, bad, but I'll, I'll maybe in terms of telling that story offer some insight into the sort of situation we're sitting here confronting today, which is uh, when we were, George Tennant and I went to uh, see President Musharraf in October 2001, the issue was that the U.S. intelligence had information that Pakistani scientists may have been uh, meeting with al-Qaeda and that one of them, in fact, who ran their plutonium reactor uh, was the director of the plutonium reactor. At one point, A.Q. Khan worked for him, uh, was, uh, was in fact had a campfire discussion with bin Laden about how to help al-Qaeda get nuclear weapons. Uh, at the time, we briefed, when that was briefed to Vice President Cheney and Dr. Rice in the White House, uh, the key question was, uh, can we trust ISI with that in- intelligence? Well, the reality was, the answer was, not without ensuring that it went right directly to President Musharraf first, and he would make a decision and hopefully do the right thing. Second, uh, anytime you're confronting an intelligence organization with basically demands that will involve them doing things that they deem are not necessarily in their interests or get into their most sensitive national security areas like nuclear weapons in Pakistan, uh, you can't you know, take for granted that you're going to get much cooperation. So. I think there's some similarities to this in terms of those calculations. And there's an irony in the side that one of the things that the director of central intelligence knew when he went to go see the president was that we were already aware that there was this thing called the AQCon network that was operating, which we weren't prepared in 2001 to tell the Pakistani government for very similar reasons. So there's there's a history here. And to this day, and I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to speculate, I would say some of the issues we talked about about this, what 
the degree of complicity and knowledge in the Pakistan government is very similar to the discussion we've been having with ourselves for years related to AQ Khan and his rogue activities to give the Libyans. Is it really feasible that, that he could build a nuclear weapons program or turn, do a turnkey operation for Muammar Gaddafi? And by the way, as an aside, can you imagine if Gaddafi had those weapons today? Is it really feasible that that happened without Pakistani government knowledge, military and, and ISI? So I think in many ways it's the same question, Graham. And I think the backdrop for it, over to you, Bob, was that if, if then, if you just imagine a military operation like the one that was conducted against Osama bin Laden, would you inform your hosts, or sorry, the country in which this operation, in which this operation is taking place, or not? And if the evidence that we see to date, I think it's likely you didn't. Okay. So, Bob, you saw a lot of operations like that. Would you? The reason why you wouldn't have told ISI, and you wouldn't have told Kayani, and you wouldn't have told the president, assuming you didn't in these cases, would be because they might leak this to Osama bin Laden and he might get away. So that's that correct. was the judgment, and would that, does that sound right to you in terms of the operations you saw? Absolutely. But however, uh, again, we are making an assumption that if you do decide to uh, collaborate with whatever organization it is. It's not just Pakistan, many other countries that we're involved in around the world. Uh, and then even within our own communities, uh, cross-service, um, conventional versus special operations. We, we all have it. We, you know, we have it here among schools. You know, what information do I sell? So it's, it's really very commonplace. Uh, but ideally, you're going into a sovereign nation. You want there. Uh, you want their blessing before you go in, especially because it's very, very dangerous. They had a long flight uh, from wherever their launching pad was into Abbottabad. Uh, very dangerous, and what you don't want, the nightmare scenario is, is you get into a fight with the Pakistani military on this operation. So but let's, um, let's that's just what think, it is way. Yeah, but think about this one for a second. So you're going into somebody else's country, they may be surprised to find some people there fighting in their country. They may even fight them. That's so correct. ideally, you would tell them, I'm coming, don't, uh, don't worry. So if it did, if I don't tell them, that's a big deal. It is a very so that big means, deal. That tells me a lot about how much trust I have for that government. Every element of the government. The president, the, the uh, head of the military, and the head of intelligence. And I think if I were a Pakistani today and I'm looking and I'm thinking, wait a minute, holy Moses, people coming into my country conducting an operation of this scale and scope, uh, I've Absolutely. learned a lot about this relationship, yeah? That's correct, but they've been, they've been concerned for years now because we've been conducting covert drone attacks there in, uh, in western Pakistan, north, north and south Waziristan. So not, uh, not dissimilar at all. And I, go ahead. Bro. No, I'm sorry. To, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I would just I have to feel like I have to jump on this because there is this kind of image of the U.S. cowboy and flouting international law, and, and, and I, I, I can see reasons for that, for, quite frankly. But, but I can say in my experience in the government, these are very hard decisions. You're actually oh, putting your own famous. people at risk. Right. And, uh, and they, they come at, we come at them very deliberately, and it's really a last resort. The default in these things, as Bob, I think, stressed, is to work collaboratively when, whenever possible. In this case, I think what we've got to recognize is I can't think of anything more exceptional than getting a shot at, at capturing or, or killing Osama bin Laden, and the U.S. wasn't going to lose the opportunity. Uh, and we, in fact, have made a, had a declaratory policy that essentially states that anywhere we find him in the world, we would have done something similar if we didn't think we could do this. And, and so I think that's very much an exception, hopefully, to the rule of how we want to operate internationally. And take that exception uh, a step further is why we went in on a, uh, a direct action raid versus bombing is wanted the verifiable proof that... Uh, so how does killed. it uh, feel as a citizen of Pakistan to have people come visiting from time to time, shooting up... Uh, Pakistani citizens, presumably there were some there as well as the Al Qaeda crowd, and telling you after. Well, it feels like uh, feels like Mexico in the 19th century. 
Um, it's, uh, and how it must have felt about this country. Um, it's, here's the thing, right? Uh, I am actually positive about this um, in the following way. I think the right noises have been coming out uh, from, uh, from uh, this country's leadership. I think so far, uh, yes, there have been some, uh, some budget thumpers and some soothsayers in, in, in Congress. Uh, Diane Feinstein is, is, is making some noises. But uh, I, I'm very encouraged by Harry Reid's um, uh, statement so far. He's urging caution when it comes to, you know, pulling the plug on Pakistani aid. Uh, so is uh, Speaker Boehner. Uh, he has been very cautious as well. Uh, so far, the only within the administration, uh, the, the, the counterterrorism czar, John Brennan, has uh, expressed uh, incredulity about, uh, you know, not believing that there was a systemic sort of, um, uh, there was something in place on the ground. But I think uh, Secretary Clinton, um, I think uh, even um, uh, Director Panetta, um, and more, most importantly, President Obama, um, said that, have said that uh, the following things. A, Pakistan is a victim in this as well. They have lost people. They have committed. It hasn't been easy for them. Uh, B, they have cited Pakistan's civilian leadership. They have very nicely not mentioned the military leadership at all. At all. Uh, I think that's a very good indication of how this country is finally coming to terms in getting a handle on what Pakistan really is to the United States. When you say Pakistan, mind you, there's several Pakistans, but there's essentially three Pakistans. One, the 180 million impoverished people, uh, mostly uneducated, no gas, no electricity, no jobs, by the way, half of them under 25. That's the first Pakistan. The second Pakistan is the so-called political elite, corrupt, inefficient, but, well, guess what, this congressman of this country who, are, who still go to jail for corruption as well. Um, so that's a problem which is worldwide. Third, the, the 130, 140-odd formation commanders of the Pakistani army, which is the smallest clique, which runs that country like a country club, right? Uh, they own everything. They make everything from, from, from underwear to, to cereals to nuclear missiles. And they do it without, with impunity and without any sort of accountability. And I think finally... This country has realized, and, it's, and you can see it between the lines, because there is outright very little criticism of the Pakistani, of the nascent Pakistani civilian establishment. There has been no outright criticism of the military, but the way things played out on the ground, no um, tactical um, information was shared, uh, I'm assuming, because as, as was just established by both Rolf and Bob and yourself, that... There's very little trust that two cups of tea, Mullen's two cups of tea, was a hoax. It was a facade. It didn't happen. And yes, uh, Islamabad, just so you know, Pakistan, uh, David Ignatius said this on the Charlie Rose show a couple of days back, and, and I completely believe him, that Pakistan is the toughest place in the world to have a conversation in. Because, I mean, you know, nothing gets, gets said without being picked up by the U.S. So, and, and he swears that uh, it wasn't in the system. Because if this was in the system within the military, it would have been picked up. So something's up. And obviously it's got a lot to do with the distrust between the two militaries. But the good news, I feel, is that the right stakeholders in this country are making the right noises despite of this overhauling larger thing about, oh, this, how could he be under your noses? Okay. I, I think that's a, a hopeful and optimistic note uh, to conclude the part about Pakistan. I will only give as a footnote... From the moderator's point of view, I would say, watch this space. My prediction is that this relationship sours dramatically. That'd be my bet if I'm watching. Uh, and I don't think that's a good thing. I'm just thinking that's a factual thing. But and that's I'm going to qualify that's my that, bet. Graham, by yep. saying your relationship with who? Which Pakistan? No, the no, people? With, the with, government with or the military? All of them. Okay? Americans don't do nuance. Okay? That's, uh, <laughs> As George, as George Bush once famously said. Let me go. One, one more question, then we're going to the, to the microphone. So please think of your questions. So uh, how may this affect America's engagement, not only in Pakistan, but in Afghanistan, and specifically the theory of the case called COIN, or counterinsurgency, according to which uh, Americans need to be there with boots on the ground securing a space 
in order to fight terrorism. Now, that's the story under which Obama, President Obama tripled down in Afghanistan. And Bob, you were there for watching this both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. So we went to Afghanistan because of Al-Qaeda and 9-11 and Osama bin Laden. And the proposition was to eliminate them there and prevent their return. That's correct. And so 100,000 troops, $100 billion this year for Afghanistan. But it turns out Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. Actually, that's where we thought he was to start with. So uh, let me think again. Why am I in Afghanistan with 100,000 troops and $100 billion? So we're coming up to July when President Obama has said the surge is over and we're starting out. So is this an opportunity or, or is it likely to be a pivot from coin and securing a country and building it in order to fight terrorism? That's the theory of Afghanistan. To just going and getting the bad guys wherever they are. If they're in Pakistan, get them in Pakistan. If they're in Afghanistan, get them in Afghanistan. They're in, uh, in Yemen, get them in Yemen. They're in Somalia, get them in Somalia. They're in London or in New York. So you have to look for them where... It, if, if terrorism is a problem of terrorists, the people, where they happen to be may be more incidental. So just in terms of the theory of the case... Are we now likely to see the debate pivot to, well, we don't need to do Afghanistan anymore. We've done it enough for whatever it is. In any case, we got the guy we went to. And so let's move to a different strategy, more like what was involved in eliminating bin Laden. And if so, with what consequences for both Afghanistan and Pakistan and, 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 and uh, Yemen? Uh, where we were otherwise building a, something like counterinsurgency. How do you, how do you see that? Because I know you've been struggling with uh, ca- ca- the COIN doctrine you're familiar with, have been involved in implementing, the CT world you come from, and you've been trying to make sense of this picture yet. Well, I'm only trying to make sense of it because I have a final paper due for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. It'll be brilliant, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to reading it. May I give me a preview? Okay. Yeah. Well... Uh, first of all, a CT, a CT strategy, and, and it's one, a CT plus strategy, uh, essentially espoused by the vice president. The issue with that is uh, when, we, when we go into sovereign nations or wherever al-Qaeda might be around the world, and we bomb them, we create more enemies. Now, if our good friends in Pakistan would allow us to come in uh, invite us to come in to assist them with fighting al-Qaeda. And there are quite a bit of al-Qaeda and Pakistani Taliban who are, uh, are very much against the United States in, uh, in western Pakistan. Then, then we would do so. But we haven't been invited in, not, uh, not in any great numbers anyway. So we're supporting as best we can the, uh, the Pakistani military and their government and, and their people to to become force multipliers for the United States. President Obama, his stated mission in the national security strategy he wrote in May of 2010 was to dis- disrupt, defeat, dismantle al-Qaeda. That's the reason why we're in Afghanistan. So you're, you're wondering why, uh, why do we have 100,000, 100, 130,000 troops and then civilians and then NATO in there also. And, and it's just that if if we're not standing up the Afghan infrastructure and their security forces to become force multipliers to, uh, to prevent al-Qaeda and the Taliban from coming back in, it will occur. If we just pull back all of our troops, and I've already seen uh, lots of reports out, that debate has hit the news as soon as bin Laden, uh, his death was confirmed, let's pull out of Afghanistan. And, and I will tell you, I'd be shocked if that happens. And it's simply because al-Qaeda is not simply Osama bin Laden. He he has become and has been for years a spiritual leader. But again, it's a very diffuse organization. And 
it has spun off affiliates around the world, Yemen, uh, Indonesia, lots of places that, that we have to get involved. So uh, what, what America and President Obama is trying to do is a whole of government approach is not just focused on the security aspect of things, but, uh, but targeted aid, economic, uh, humanitarian, lots of aid packages, and I believe we're trying to do that in Pakistan. And we give, uh, we give lots of money to do that. We target programs, but ultimately it's up to that sovereign nation on how they spend that money. And, uh, and simply a CT strategy is, uh, that's going to create more enemies than... Uh, May I, Rob? Yeah, please. Yeah. Just, just, Bob, just a, just a quick, quick, uh, quick uh, follow-up as well as a counterpunch. First of all, I think uh, the, the word you used, uh, invite us, uh, I think uh, invite us to, to come in. Uh, I think you need to really uh, think hard about what that really means, especially in context of the fact that there, has, there is enough evidence that uh, the Pakistani military has been, for the, for the last several years now, 04, 05, that is, that's when it kind of started, but the Pakistani military has at some level helped the U.S. Uh, conduct its drone campaign in Pakistan. Exactly. Right? Uh, that has sort of filled the vacuum up. Uh, there was a need uh, for better policing, more coin, more CT in that area, but the drone campaign has sort of been the, 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 the has filled that void. Uh, where the Pakistanis get a beating themselves, where they don't want to risk casualties, they just, you know, call in the drones and blame it on you guys. Right? And you guys look like you're doing your job. The Pakistanis look like they're doing their job, which is not letting you guys do anything. There's plausible deniability. Nobody comments on it, but that is the essence of the drone campaign. Both sides walk away with tangible gains. Um, secondly, uh, there's already American, as we saw in the Raymond Davis affair, which I like, who I like calling the, the human drone, right? Raymond Davis was, a, 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 is considered a paramilitary slash contractor slash outsourced intel operative. There's hundreds of guys like him in Pakistan um, right now. I've met a few of them. I've talked to a few of them. And that has been, uh, that's the hand the U.S. has played to, once again, fit, the U.S. cannot roll into Pakistan with two wars You're exactly on, right. you know, coming into, and, and, and it's a very different country than what Afghanistan and Iraq was. Firstly, it's three times, four times larger than both of them. It's almost 200 million people. Secondly, it has nukes. I don't want to get into this. You know the details. You're the ranger, right? But the bottom line, though, is that do not discount what's been going on versus what has happened. I don't think uh, that uh, Graham's nu no nuance thing, I think, honestly, Graham, I, 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 I disagree. I respectfully disagree. I think uh, this country, this administration has been so nuanced that it's been ridiculous. I think uh, back in 2007, when uh, uh, this country's president-to-be, uh, he wasn't elected at the time, he showed his teeth, uh, and he went on uh, with a famous quote, which was huge in Pakistan. I don't know if it was really picked up here, but he said that we will go into Pakistan uh, whether and uh, uh, if there is a high-value target, whether they like it or not. And whether we tell them or not is a whole other different matter. In Pakistan, things blew up. All of a sudden, by the way, we didn't like Obama. Like the rest of the world, we were kind of liking him at that point. But when that, when that quote came, that, listen, I'll come in whether you like it or not, whether Mosh does something or not about it, that sort of really split apart the Pakistani policy when it comes to supporting Barack Obama. But I think it's been one of the most nuanced approaches by this administration. A, he's put his money where his mouth is and actually done exactly that. B, he has dismantled the aid infrastructure of the last decade and stop giving money outright without conditions to the Pakistani military and finally seen where the real nurturing and the growth is required, and that is in the civilian, educational, poverty reduction, you know, health infrastructures, which is what will really save that country. Drones won't. This will, and that's what Obama, and this, this great state senator, John Kerry, was one of the co-authors of that bill. So was Vice President Biden. The KLB bill, the Kerry, the Kerry Luger Berman bill, by the way, was the first bill. I don't know if you guys heard about it in this country, but back in Pakistan, that's what really shook things up. And guess, but just because all of that money for the first time in our history with the U.S., the first time American legislators sat down and said, we'll stop giving money to the generals and we'll start giving it to these poor people. And guess who stopped it? 
No, it wasn't someone from Indiana or Mississippi or a Republican or whatever. No, it was, it was a bipartisan bill. Guess who stopped that bill? Who tried to stop it? The Pakistani military. They wouldn't let that go in because they wanted to make sure that every penny this country can give out of its taxpayers' money to that country should go to the military first because that's how militaries think. And I think it's been terribly nuanced, terribly nuanced with the so way this country is done. To be clear, my, my proposition is not that President Obama is not extremely nuanced. This is an extremely smart law professor. So he d- does nuance for breakfast. It is that American politics... As you watch the dynamics, I would say, write it down, watch this space, uh, for even Kerry Berman Lugar, watch the appropriation next year, and if it's equal the 1.5 promise, I'll give you 20 bucks, and if it's not, you give me a dollar. Okay, Ralph, you get the last Yeah, I, I, I would just like to go back to your, to your premise, Graham, and, and I agree lo- with Bob, Bob's assessment, but I'd just like to add an aspect to that. Uh, right now, I think there are relative advantages for Al Qaeda and its associates, and taking that to mean the broader Al Awlaki and Yemen and the rest, and us. The, for, for, for us, it's the fact that we have, in fact, created a leadership vacuum which someone's going to have to fill. And there's a real question, I think, in many people's mind whether Zawahiri is that person or whether it shifts. But that's that's one aspect. In addition, they're going to have to deal with the U.S. reaction to what's happened in, in a tactical and a longer level. And another uh, relative U.S. advantage is the fact Al-Qaeda's ideology and narrative, uh, the, 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 uh, say, attractiveness of that in the Arab Spring context we now find ourselves, the world finds itself, has been greatly reduced. So uh, in that context, uh, I think the U.S. has got a lot going for it, going ahead uh, in trying to devise a strategy. I would just focus also on sort of the possibilities of Secretary Gates' speech at West Point which I won't assess or say what he meant or accept to, to relate the fact that it raises a question of how we do these things in the future in this new context of an Arab world that's in, in a very different situation than it was even, say, a year ago. To the other side, there, Al-Qaeda does have some relative advantages, and that's what I wanted to, to, to close on very briefly. The first is that there's greater uncertainty now in terms of the sanctuary issue that Graham really hit on. What does sanctuary mean? I'm not going to answer that question, except people are going to have to rethink the notion of an Afghanistan or a Pakistan as a sanctuary. With a Somalia, with a Yemen, we already saw those things coming. But right now, that could be virtually anywhere in the Middle East. As we found before 9-11, it could be in Hamburg. It could be in Madrid. Uh, so this notion of a, of, a, of a global terrorism response, in addition to, I think, what you rightly pointed out, uh, needs to be done, or in some different measure of resources and emphasis, is I think what uh, I would say I, I hear from Graham, and, and I certainly think this is a great time for many of you, whether you're in the military or here at the Kennedy School, to be thinking of new solutions, because I think the, the context, I'll just close with the context of the Arab Spring and what that means, is a completely different way forward than what we've experienced over the last decade or so. That's good. So the Microphones are open. They're here on the floor on both sides and in the loge. Uh, All questions uh, uh, relevant to the topic today are welcome. Uh, Short comments to introduce the question are allowed. Uh, Long speeches are not. And uh, uh, introduce yourself, please, and then ask your question. This gentleman's first. Uh, Marvin Brams, Divinity School here at Harvard. Uh, do you think that the success we've had uh, in eliminating uh, bin Laden may actually signal a turn in U.S. policy to disposing of other leaders who we find exceptionally troublesome, for example, like Gaddafi or Ahmadinejad? Is there some sort of a shift in mental perception that somehow this kind of uh, activity is now more acceptable? So, uh, you know, it seems like a good bargain. You know, you get rid of one person to save the lives of thousands. It's a good question, and not everybody has to answer every question, but go ahead. Just very quick. I I, I don't think so. I'd be very hesitant to ascribe some sort of doctrine to this. I think the exceptionality of bin Laden is self-evident. I would say just as a footnote to it, it would be interesting, though, and there's a nice debate to have, which is how about... Uh, if Saddam Hussein was the problem, would one bullet have been preferred to uh, 
uh, occupying the country? We and the answer is in principle, yes. And then the next question is, yes, but then or is the U.S. going to be in the business of targeted assassination of guys that they don't like, whomever they might be? And the answer is, well, that gets pretty complicated. And the international legal questions yes. raised before where we go. But we're not going to debate that one. This lady's next. Yeah, hello. Um, I am Elena, and I'm a French teaching assistant at Harvard. Uh, my question is focused on something a little bit different. It's about the hostages held by al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Do you think uh, bin Laden's death might uh, threaten their lives or might actually make the negotiations still possible or, I don't know? I think a absolutely could threaten their lives. It, they were killing hostages before bin Laden was dead and when he was alive and well. Uh, I think those threats certainly still exist and and those, uh, those decisions, I mean, those outcomes go into the decision-making process before the president decides to launch or tactical commanders decide to launch on targets. They take that into effect. But unfortunately, yes, they are, they are at risk. Um, well, obviously. But uh, he, we've, we've, heard this, uh, we've heard this before. Um, he, um, back in um, the 90s, when he was coming of age, uh, and again, in the mid-2000s, uh, when he had come of age, uh, Osama uh, went on the record and said exactly that, especially after the uh, U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, his uh, recording in uh, 2006 uh, explicitly uh, mentioned that uh, now that you have uh, our prisoners, and he was obviously talking about, this was in the aftermath of Abu Ghraib, mind you, uh, and uh, he, he took that as, a, as his cue, and uh, said that we will do the same, if not worse, to your prisoners. Gentleman in the loge. Good afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Carter, uh, United States Marine Corps National Security Fellow here at the Kennedy School, and I want to thank the panelists for uh, uh, their comments on a very important topic. My question is for Bob Kinder. Uh, sir, uh, you've spent a lot of time advising uh, the ISAF commander on, on a number of things, particularly uh, counterterrorism. What advice would you give General Petraeus regarding the way ahead? It, specifically, does Osama bin Laden change the calculus regarding the counter in, in uh, counterinsurgency strategy on the battlefield? Jerry? General Thanks. McChrystal, one of his S2s. Yes, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I think it, that it's, it's really not very significant concerning the counterinsurgency strategy to, uh, to Karzai and his administration, uh, the death or, or continued life of Osama bin Laden was inconsequential because his problems are so pervasive there just within his own, his own government and then uh, out amongst the, the 34 provinces where he's trying to take control, exert control, and build a nation. So I don't think General Petraeus and, and his successor are frankly going to change, uh, change very much. The, uh, the t Joint Special Operations Task Forces that are operating out of, out of there, uh, their target sets may ch shift and uh, morph, but they're in collaboration with the ISAF commander, so no, Jerry, I don't think it's going to change a great deal. Thank you. Okay. That'll be an interesting space to watch, too, especially as that comes into the political season. And Mike Murphy who's a sometimes colleague here uh, and a great Republican political strategist, was interviewed in the Washington Post 10 days ago. And Murphy's, uh, who feels currents very well, his read is that public support in the Republican Party for the current level of effort in Afghanistan will collapse during the Republican primaries. So that's his bet. So this is the further. Next. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Jad. I'm an MPA student, uh, first year. Uh, my question goes to both to uh, Jahad and to uh, your, uh, the American and the, and the Pakistani perspective. It seems to me that the, the death of uh, Bin Laden is, is kind of puts the question mark of the future of the American-Pakistani relationship. This is the core of the discussion right now. Uh, disengagement or engagement by the U.S. in Pakistan. Um, 
My question relates to the loss of Pakistan as a strategic ally of the U.S. or the break of that relationship has great implications when it comes to Pakistan switching to the China side. It seems to me that there is in Pakistan, or Jihad might confirm or deny that, a kind of turning point in the public opinion, in, even in the military, that maybe the relationship with the United States is too shaky, too tough, and maybe China is a more reliable partner. And that switch, if it happens, have huge implications, I think, on the United States, especially that you know, China's connection by land, uh, energy-wise, uh, the link between Iran and, and China passes by Afghanistan and Pakistan on the map uh, in terms of pipelines and so on. So the link is it's very important for China to have that link. Is this the way the U.S. is kind of looking at Pakistan as well in that sense? Is, is it, does this come into the calculation of what are the implications of Pakistan switching to China or, or losing that relationship? And is this in Pakistan also considered as a, as a, as a possibility or is this on the table? A- excellent question about would maybe the realignments in the big, big uh, geopolitical chessboard. So how about we start with the Americans and then the Pakistanis? You started off uh, your statement by saying Pakistan is, is a strategic partner, or it certainly is one of our strate- strategic interests, and that has not changed, and it's in our best interest to continue to uh, grow that. They're a, they're a nuclear-armed state. Um, there's significant uh, issues with extremists in Western Pakistan. They have their own terrorist problems. The Pakistani Taliban are operating in there. Um, we're going to continue to work very hard on growing that relationship and, uh, and not break it. What? How about your Chinese friend? Do you, well, do you think that's a better, better partnership than the one you got? Well, I think that's, that's, I think that's the dragon in the room, Jada. I think that's the, that's the real question, right? And I think, um, I think you've nailed it because that's what nobody picks up on. Uh, those are the nuances which, uh, unfortunately, uh, according to Graham, which aren't being seen, but I have a feeling they are being seen. Um, according to the Pakistani strategic mindset, there's this new argument floating around. It's been floating around for a couple of years now. Uh, I call it the, the right side of history argument. Uh, that's a direct quote uh, from a high source in the ISI who told me, who, who told me that. That now in this, uh, and this was especially came into play after uh, the U.S. Uh, announced its pullout uh, last year. Um, the Pakistanis, once again, once bitten twice shy about the U.S. experience in the region, think of this in the following terms. That this country... Uh, because of its very mechanism of inconsistent policy. Because policy, if you're very lucky, uh, s- switches every, every eight years in this country. If you're very unlucky, it switches every four years in this country. It's a democracy. That's how this country works. Um, the Pakistanis uh, can't deal with that. And I'm specifically talking about the Pakistani security establishment. They don't like that inconsistency. They don't like that change. And mind you, any student of Pakistan, U.S. bilateralism, would understand that that's exactly how it's been. A love affair, a breakup, uh, sanctions, which is alimony, and then another love affair, <laughs> right? And coming back and forth, and coming back and forth. And that's how it's kind of been. Uh, but uh, as far as this new policy is concerned, as the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. Uh, while uh, this country has been uh, giving Pakistan money, yes, the 10, 20 billion dollars, whatever, guess what China has been doing? It's been uh, nuking uh, Pakistan up uh, to the hilt. Pakistan, if uh, this was, uh, I keep on saying this, it's a bad joke, but if, uh, if uh, this was uh, the NCAA basketball thingy competition, Pakistan would be in the final four right now. We'd have a, we'd have a very proud coach because we'd, we'd be the, in the final four as far as uh, nuclear capability is concerned. We have more warheads, uh, evidently, than uh, the other guys, most of the other guys. We've overtaken India, so to say. Uh, now, uh, that's what China has been doing. Mind you, that hasn't been coming in from the States. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, it sees, and this, is, this should be America's big, big lesson to learn from, from its experience with Pakistan. The Chinese have succeeded where the Americans have failed. Well, the Americans, with their inbuilt inconsistency because of the democratic setup, you know, policy has to change. 
And thus, that inconsistency has translated into a breakdown and a reconstruction every time, a bit of a cosmetic makeover with Pakistan. The Chinese have been consistent for the last four or five decades. And those chickens, those Chinese ducks or whatever, are finally coming back home to roost. The Pakistani establishment feels that the Chinese are better partners, uh, more consistent partners. Uh, they give them nukes. Uh, they give them what they need. Uh, most Chinese tanks, most Pakistani uh, military hardware today, by the way, is Chinese. Uh, most Pakistani roads are built uh, with uh, Chinese help. Uh, rumor has it uh, there's PLA troops in Gilgit, Baltistan. It was confirmed uh, a couple of weeks ago to me by the Pakistani ambassador to the UN who was visiting here. Um, he's saying, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a division size strength somewhere in there. We don't know what they're doing, but they're there. And he said it on the record, so I can say it. Um, so they have a very different... Imagine a division of U.S. troops okay. in, 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 in Pakistan. That would be a, that'd be a very different equation. You think, the same. Uh, wait, you, wait, just wait. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Could, it be Quickly, possible, yeah. could it be possible that uh, Pakistan is embracing China because they have a con- common enemy of India? Well, that's certainly... Wow. That's a, it wow. certainly helps. Uh, I would say that a, a Pakistani friend's comment about uh, this one, just as a footnote, was that uh, we, we would embrace China, but China wouldn't embrace us. But we'll watch. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Michael Brower. I studied at this school so many decades ago that uh, it was called the Litauer School. John Good. F. Kennedy was a senator and had not yet become elected president and assassinated. Uh, My question has to do with the use by the United States of unmanned pilotless drone bombers. Uh, And the American uh, corporate media, which loves war, uh, reports that we've killed so many terrorists. But when I read behind the scenes and goes into depth, I read that we often kill, what we've bombed weddings, for example, we often kill innocent women and children by the dozens, by the score, maybe even by the hundreds, with our pilotless drone bombers. My question, doesn't that make this country, my country, the United States, a terrorist nation? Very well said. Uh, Bob, you were talking to the point about what's the consequences of predators. Again, I don't, I'm not even sure what the... I don't think the U.S. government uh, admits that there are predators and that they are fighting... But the New York Times reports, I think reliably, that predators fly around, for example, in Pakistan and Afghanistan and hit targets from time to time, including targets that include what would be called in military terms collateral damage, but many civilians. You were speaking to the point, so go right ahead. If you choose to call uh, our actions... um in Pakistan or or elsewhere around the world using drones that were terrorists. I'm I'm sorry that you feel that way. Uh, Collateral damage, as it's called, it's a sanitary term. It is awful. It it is awful. As you said, unfortunately, we're... uh, What often happens is um, women and children or innocent civilians are killed when those things uh, strike. And... And it, I think it's a very unfortunate uh, system that, that we've had to adapt to try to kill al-Qaeda that are planning attacks here in the United States. And, and the uh, decision-making cycle that goes into play is very careful, and they try to, uh, to limit zero. They, they don't want any casualties other than the terrorists. And, uh, and I read the same reports. New America Foundation does a very good job. Um, reporting. Uh, they use, use reports out of Pakistan. And again, the, the sanitary term is called collateral damage, and it, and it is a very unfortunate term because, as you said, it's women and children um, that are being killed. And, uh, and we've killed a lot of al-Qaeda, a lot of Taliban that have had plans here in the United States. And, uh, and, but any time that a woman or a, or a child is killed in that, it's unfortunate. This lady is next. Uh, I just, a quick, just, just, yeah. a quick, just a quick response. While you may have your right uh, to, uh, to redress and disagree with the, with the drone policy, it's one of those murky gray areas, and you might find this shocking coming from a Pakistani, but I have to admit it. On the one hand, uh, the drones have helped. 
On the other hand, they've perpetuated the war onwards, and that's just the bottom line. They've, how have they helped? Uh, well, um, they have a uh, kept a ground invasion of American troops out, which would uh, create a whole other a whole other hellish sort of nightmare. And secondly, it's actually provided the Pakistani state, the Pakistani military, to not engage directly and uh, actually and essentially not take the casualties they've taken. And it's actually, in a way, helped build up some trust and build up some sort of operational stability between those two countries. Now, off late, that's broken down. There's indicators that uh, the, the, the Americans have stopped telling the Pakistanis that where they're going to hit. And there's been a problem there. But things have broken down at large. But on the other hand, uh, and by the way, Pakistani military officials recently, uh, the guy in charge of that area, this, this, this three-star general, said that. He said that, yeah, this, this works. And he said it on the record. Uh, the other problem is that, the, that it, it, it's, it's a perpetual war. The collateral damage, as Bob wonderfully put it, it's a sanitized term, it's too clinical. But, um, hey, that's, that's war. It's imperfect. Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't think the Pakistanis or the Americans had a better choice. This lady is next. Thank you so much. Um, Iram Sattar, first-year doctoral student at the law school from Pakistan. The Arab Spring was mentioned at the end, and so I'd like to shift this to a broader um, sort of, you know, sort of geographical base. I know the China question was brought up. Um, as we know, and maybe this is sort of um, to you, because you're the one who brought up the Arab Spring question. Um, as we know, we've heard that Mubarak was abandoned at the last minute by, you know, the ally, the U.S., and that felt, he felt betrayed, etc. Other people are feeling threatened in a similar way. Uh, if the details of this operation weren't shared with the Pakistani establishment at any level, then there's Obviously, a lack of trust uh, running very deep. We've heard today that the core commanders met today um, under General Kayani, and they've said that they will be reviewing national security anew um, in this coming week, etc. So a lot of distrust. What does the broader Middle Eastern perspective mean um, for this lack of trust that's probably running really deep in the two establishments? Oh, a, a big question. That's a Good. big question. Rolf? Yeah. I, I, I would perhaps start with, with the idea that, as I'm watching this frenzy, you're seeing an incredible amount of information. It, it's, sort of, it's symptomatic of everything we know about the information age. You don't know what to trust, not trust. Even I, as someone from my... I, I, I'm also guessing at what's accurate and not ac- accurate. But we're getting unprecedented... Love. You're, getting, you're getting, for example, satellite imagery of the compound to make your own... In a way, it's a, it, it's a metaphor, I think, for what the Arab Spring is sort of driven by, which is people that are enabled. So this enablement, the Pakistani and U.S. governments now have some real soul-searching to do about what the relationship means on a strategic level, because everyone's going to know. And everyone's going to know every detail to make their own judgments. And all the things we've talked about here, such as, uh, such as how far does this go within the that there is some level of collusion, certainly. So how far does that go? Those are things you're all probably going to be able to assess for yourselves. And you've seen, for example, the administration make some missteps on, have to with, take, pull back, because everything is being assigned. Everybody can find it. So to the Arab Spring, as we go forward, uh, you know, part of this is, again, going to be, uh, what's the narrative? You know, what's the narrative that, that takes this beyond, that makes sense of a relationship where there's been a deep betrayal? And I think that's, that's, you, can, you can extrapolate from there to other countries. This lady in the lounge, please. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Stephanie Lewis. I'm a senior Harvard undergrad studying government. My question is, when the intelligence community is collecting intelligence and also trying to reduce the risk that that source may have, uh, what, val- what information is most valuable? You know, for example, visual imagery, is, is that more reliable than um, State Department or CIA intelligence or mobile phone technology? Like, what do you see the next trend being for right. information Well, I'm, I'm terribly biased, but I, mm-hmm. to me, the, the decisive intelligence tends to be human intelligence um, and, and the analysis of it. But then the augmentation of that intelligence, we call it in the, in the trade, the all-source analysis, which combines the technical. There was a tendency in the U.S. after the collapse of the Soviet Union where all our threats became more disparate and diffuse to try to rely heavily on national technical means and collection and technical things to answer questions where we didn't have penetrating presence. I think we're shifting. This, this 
success. And things like this are illustrative of the new, I call the future of intelligence, which is highly flexible, highly collaborative teams with military intelligence, even diplomatic aspects that go out and solve very specific hard problems. That's a very good question. It's, uh, it's called a collaborative network, and it has morphed over the last 10 years, uh, where before we did very, very stovepiped uh, operations. We went into 9-11 uh, with a very strong intelligence community and, and good army, but they didn't talk very well with one another, and hence situations like or events like 9-11 were able to occur. And the collaborative network that Rolf is talking about are where the different uh, intelligence agencies and the operators are sitting down at the table together and they're sharing information very rapidly and able to action targets quickly. And just a, just a quick follow-up, um, the, these, these guys are the pros and the experts, but if you follow the news closely, it was uh, a Pakistani asset, a Pakistani guy working for the CIA in Peshawar, and it was good old-fashioned police work, which did it in the end, who saw the, the license plate, as we call it, or the number plate, as you guys call it, uh, off the car and traced it back to this house. So it was good old-fashioned detective work, and that should explain it all. Please. Hi, my name is Ayman Sharaiha. I'm an MPA student at uh, Harvard. Um, on a more tangential note, from, from a sort of a bird's eye pers perspective, uh, when we compare both Afghanistan and Iraq, there, there seems to be two different approaches on how they you know, tackle the, the top, the number one guy. Can you explain what is, why the difference was between putting Saddam on trial versus killing bin Laden and then no photographs versus you know, photographing the trial? I mean, I know there were two different um, presidents at the time, but what sort of are the idiosyncratic reasons for that? What are really the considerations, Bob? That's just a very good question, and, and uh, I'm speculating. But he was a, Saddam Hussein was a head of state, and, uh, and when uh, he was found, he was in a hole uh, hiding from American forces, and drug out of that hole, uh, he surrendered. The uh, situation, again, it's... The information still coming off of the raid that just occurred a couple of nights ago with uh, bin Laden, but uh, the latest thing I read today, he was unarmed, but was threatening as he came towards them, and they're doing a night raid. Uh, things are amped up. They just left. They had just engaged some guards uh, down in the compound as they uh, found him in an upper room. So uh, just fluid, fluid situations, and once, once we have somebody captured, you know, you have to take him to custody and protect him. So I think that is, is uh, likely the scenario between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. And I'd say, again, watch this space, this gentleman. Thank you. Um, my name is Gary Langley, and um, with uh, Osama bin Laden as the uh, inspirational and spiritual head uh, leader of uh, al-Qaeda, um, I guess I'm wondering, uh, they haven't had any concrete benefit. Uh, Al-Qaeda hasn't created any concrete benefit to the Arab world. They haven't overthrown a, a, a dictator of a Middle Eastern country. They certainly haven't made life any better for the average Pakistani. It's taken the Arab street uh, um, to take control of their own destiny, or trying to. And I guess my question is, given those two sea changes, Bin, uh, Bin Laden's demise and the uprising, uh, the uh, Arab Spring. Uh, what's your uh, feeling about uh, Al-Qaeda Al becoming uh, irrelevant you know, uh, I, to I would, the Arab world? Yeah, I, I would, very, very good question mm -hmm. and so, brief answers, please, because yeah, yeah, we're coming I, to the yeah, end. Yeah. Just very quickly, when uh, very telling the reactions from Ayman Zawahiri, for example, to the Arab Spring, which is essentially an acknowledgment that, hey, we didn't cause this. Uh, but they'll give us some credit for having weakened the, the U.S. But that's not really the narrative in the Arab Spring. So I, I think they could be moving towards irrelevance if the Arab world rejects their narrative and, their, and what their ideas are for the future. Okay. Uh, I, we're, we're, gonna, we're getting to the close here. We're going to go right quick. Quick questions, quick answers, and no more additional stand-ups, please, in the lunch. Sir Tim Watson, National Security Fellow, student of... Uh, Professor Allison and a classmate of Bob's. So I, I would wonder, what is our central challenge in all this? You know, we have the Arab Spring. Uh, Osama bin Laden's dead. We're, we're working on a negotiated settlement in Afghanistan. We, we also have conflict between the, the Shia and Sunni, and the Sunni probably divided between the Salafist and the, and the Sufi. So 
what, what are our options given this, uh, this challenge of a reorder of the Muslim world? Nice, easy questions at the end, so just a short answer. You know, the best case scenario would be that we manage to finish what we started in Afghanistan, pull out an instability that's favored by the overall trends, and to the extent the overall trends favors that result in ways we can't solve militarily, because I think as we've all talked about here, the military is, is pushing things in a direction they're already going. And if it's go heading in the right direction, if the development, and, I, and there, there's, this is a 20-year process perhaps in the entire region that's going to go through a lot of peaks and valleys. But if those trends favor the things we're doing, we could have turned out with a, with a stable ending. You want to do a one, one-liner? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I disagree. Think, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I think, <laughs> the, the, I think it's irreversible. I think this is a, this is a, this is a new phase of history. I don't think uh, uh, this can be described by the optics of regular warfare, of uh, conventional geopolitics as we know it. I think, I think we failed. And uh, uh, as far as understanding the optics of those regions, once again, the nuances of that religion, its subdivisions, its, its subcultures, uh, we have uh, uh, overstayed our welcome in Afghanistan. Keep in mind, you saw the picture, so did I. There were roses in Kabul when the invasion happened, we're way beyond that point. And I think, frankly, that this is one of those phases where they'll read about this uh, sometime from now, that this was a mess up. And I don't think this is reversible anytime soon. And I don't think Osama uh, succeeded. I don't think he failed. I think he just did his job, which was to create more hydras. And uh, that's what we've got. We've got a hydra kind of situation right now. I would say, as a problem for you and uh, many other students and fellows here, to work on, there's going to be no lack of interesting questions. This lady. Hi, my name is Nadia Zafar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan. Um, to all the panelists, um, there are six times more people in Pakistan, and a growing anti-Americanism because of the drone attacks or Raymond Davis is a, a major cause of concern for U.S. security issues, which the U.S. is in Afghanistan to protect. Do you feel that uh, the government here is aware of that? Uh, Mr. Allison is saying that we should watch this space for things to get more negative and fatal uh, in this relationship. But are they aware? And if not, should they be? They're, they are absolutely aware. They're absolutely aware. And they are trying to target aid, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned. It's not, it's not just to the military, but when the floods happen in Pakistan, um, we're trying to create friends and not enemies. And frankly, we're stumbling around in, in uh, response to the last question that happened. It, it goes along. I think our, our country and our administration is stumbling along looking for answers. This is unprecedented, the upheaval that's around the world. It's not just, this is not a United States problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, the governments in these countries also were unaware that this was occurring. They didn't know their own people. Uh, we have many friends here from the Middle East and, uh, and they're going back to a very different country, a very different area from wh- whence they came here just a year or two uh-huh. ago. So quick point. we're very aware. Yeah, just, just a quick follow-up. Absolutely in agreement with Bob, but I don't think anti-American means radicalized anymore in that part of the world. I think uh, Islamist, Salafist, whatever you want to call it, radicalization is very different from anti-Americanism. I know people who are not religious who are anti-American. I know people who don't believe in God who are anti-American in that country right now. And I think that's, that's the real problem uh, versus, versus this stuff because I think that part of the world has been pretty good at, at figuring it out its own experiences with religious movements. Uh, you're from Pakistan. You do understand we've had a history of religious upheavals. And uh, we, 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 we've, we've been pretty good at figuring it out. We don't need F-15E strike eagles coming in to help us save our religion. Uh, or a democracy. We're good at that. It's in our guts. We can figure things out. But so far, I think anti-Americanism has to be bifurcated from uh, anti, uh, Islam, from being Islamist. We probably need another panel some evening or another event on Pakistan where uh, I would say a yeah, uh, huge, huge issue which you're much more familiar with than I am. But I always remember Madeleine Albright's uh, uh, one-liner on Pakistan. He says, Pakistan is the definition of an international migraine headache. Uh, please. I'm Steve Flanagan. I'm a psychology student at the Ed School. I want to ask more specifically about compl- the uh, complicity 
given that uh, bin Laden had been a guerrilla fighter for almost three decades and hiding for half that time, uh, I would tend to think he was an expert in counterintelligence, and I would think he chose that location because it, because it wouldn't be where we expect him and because it would be unlikely to do airstrike in that town, which I think he would be most afraid of. Going off uh, uh, what Bojahat said uh, about maybe they either didn't know because he was really cautious and deliberate about how he went in there, or they wanted plausible deniability. I would tend to believe one of those may be true, but Rolf and Bob, I want to see how likely you thought those alternatives would be. You know, my very quick input would be I don't personally think he would be there if he didn't have a high degree of confidence he could stay there. He was there for a very long time. They said uh, reports are that the mansion was built uh, 2005 potentially for him. Um, and, and I think, uh, I don't think, assuming that there was not complicity all the way up the chain, so he had help in order to make that happen, though. And just to wrap that up, in Urdu we have a saying, it's always darkest under the lamp. Good. Very Thank good saying. Please. These last two questions very quickly. Quick questions and quick answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to come back to Vajahat's comment that uh, Paki- uh, pa- uh, the drone attacks actually take, pla- take place with Pakistan's consent, but Pakistan's government officially keeps on denying it and even keeps on protesting to make a show of protesting. So um, in this attack, I mean, this attack took place deep in Pakistan's territory, the helicopters, I mean, they were around for 40-odd minutes. Uh, Do you think it's possible that this could have happened without some kind of consent and involvement of Pakistan? And if if the U.S. can attack, if this attack can take place so deep in Pakistan's territory and the Pakistanis couldn't find out, you know, if there's that level of incompetence, then is it very far-fetched to assume that they were also incompetent enough to know that Osama was hiding uh, in, in that compound. Very, very good question. Uh, just yes, no, or quick, quick one-liners. What do you think? Go ahead, partner. You start. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's highly possible that they were not aware that this occurred. However, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there, there's government, uh, supposed government complicity. Uh, they're aware of the drone, drone attacks in western Pakistan. However, that's not what is, uh, what is portrayed in the media. Well, I mean, the only addition to that is uh, just a few hours ago, the Pakistani foreign ministry said that it had given uh, information, very loose, the very loose press release, but just so you know, it is a press release, uh, that it had given uh, uh, information about this location in 2009. Um, bottom line, that's, they haven't followed up on that. But I, I, I think this is something which was, which was sort of uh, pre-figured out. It was sort of like an sort of like a, a, a indemnity clause that if this happens, this, these are the things which are going to go forward. And I think that's exactly what's happening. I don't think the Americans trust the Pakistani military enough to share any information operationally on the ground. I don't th- and that's obvious. And uh, now the Pakistani military is scrambling to do what it was supposed to do, which is step away from the crime scene and act dumb. Last question. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Jim Platty. I'm a PhD student at the Fletcher School just up the road here. And um, but very briefly, we've learned over the last few years a lot of speculation about the security of the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. Um, and now with Chinese assistance, uh, the Pakistani nuclear industry will be growing. And I just wonder what you think, if there's a growing level of mistrust between the two on a mill-to-mill, gov-to-gov level, what could be the U.S. response to Pakistani assurances that their arsenal, their fissile material stockpiles are secure? Well, I think... Well, Ralph, you've spent a lot of uh, years <laughs> working on this problem. Yeah, I, I say as, as a first principle is the U.S. has limited influence. I mean, there's a lot of, I call loose talk out there that the U.S. military go in and take away the weapons. Uh, that's very unfortunate for lots of reasons, probably first of which is we couldn't do it. So it is fundamentally something the Pakistanis are going to have to figure out. And the U.S. policy is somewhat conflicted between the desire to help on the nuclear security front, uh, which which we do through the Department of Energy to some extent, but also hold Pakistan to task for the growing program. It's a growing that's not under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. 
and we, any, any tacit acknowledgement of its growth, existence and growth would be, I think, a big policy mistake, particularly since you have three things that I don't think any other country in the world confronts with nuclear arsenals. Number one, instability in the country. Number two, large numbers of extremists that are potential insiders in the nuclear establishment. And three is what you referred to, which is a growing program of more weapons that are smaller and more lethal with more facilities that could go wrong from a nuclear security standpoint. Quickly. And I think that a precedent has been set. I think now it's been established that if the stakes are high enough, the U.S. can send in uh, a, a, a group of soldiers to do what they have to do and get out with or without Pakistan's permission. And I think that has serious implications for Pakistan's nuclear arsenal as far as its security is concerned. I think uh, that's the next big question, uh, which I'm assuming uh, the, the Pentagon is asking itself right now. Okay, so we've done this. This is how they've reacted. What if we have a, what's called a, uh, what, I'm, you're, the, you're the nuclear uh, guy, but I mean, is it called a black arrow situation or whatever, if a nuke goes missing, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, the, Indian, uh, the Indians, not to be held back, just came out with a statement a couple hours ago and said, well, if the Americans can do it, we have surgical strike capability too. So, so <laughs> as if that was required. But yes, that's, that's the, that's the hot, hot headline in India right now. So that's where Pakistan's nukes are right now. The United States <laughs> has extraordinarily, they've got the best special operations forces in the world. We are incapable of going in and getting every dispersed nuclear weapon in Pakistan. It's not feasible. Mm. I think you're, but I think the, the, why the question is such a good question, and it's a good one to close on, you can watch this space again. The, uh, from a Pakistani point of view, uh, is there paranoia about America seeking to disarm its nuclear weapons? Of course. Why shouldn't there be? And also India. Why, of course. Why shouldn't there be? The fact that this occurred in these terms would lead a paranoid Pakistani who was in charge of the nuclear weapons to do what? Be more relaxed or to be more nervous? There's obviously to be more nervous. And if you're more nervous, you're more likely to be more dispersed. And if you're more dispersed, I'm even more worried because the risk that some of these weapons go loose in the case of instability or of an insider group is worse. So I would say this is uh, not, not good news. So let me uh, conclude uh, with just two comments. First, uh, to remind you that on Friday, so that's, what, two days from now, uh, at 3 p.m. here in the forum, uh, the former president of Chile who's currently the UN Undersecretary General, will be here talking about re-envisioning re the future, closing equality gra gaps for women and girls, Michelle Bichelet. So that's very interesting. Friday at 3 o'clock. And finally, let's say thank you to our panelists for stirring the pot.